I think when we talk about depression, um, I think there's a, uh, there's a lot of times where we think of depression as sort of a one-size-fit-all kind of diagnosis. Um, if, we, if we look at sort of the, uh, the DSM, which is our, um, our, our basically our Bible on sort of all the different psychiatric diagnoses that we, will, uh, we, we can work with, basically. Uh, we're using a model that was initially developed uh, with adults in mind. I mean, this, is a, th this, this manual is, I don't know, somewhere between 900 and 1,000 pages long. And, um, and most of them, most of those pages are devoted towards these diagnoses that, in general, most of the research has come out related to adults. And then we have kind of tried to force fit these diagnoses onto kids. Sometimes it, it works fairly well. Other times it doesn't work so well. Now, what's interesting about DSM, you can, you can, it's about, like I said, 900 to 1,000 pages long. There's only about 200 of that page is devoted towards children and adolescents. And most of the difficulties or most of the diagnoses that are involved in those in terms of the child, they, they're, they're associated with sort of more behavioral or developmental issues. They're not related to sort of what does a mood disorder, how does it differ from, for example, an adult? They don't spend a lot of time talking about that. You know, what does a psychotic disorder look like in an adult and what does it look like in a kid? What does an anxiety disorder and so forth? What is a, what is personality features look like in a kid that, and, and what do they look like in an adult? We don't really have a lot of guidance here. This is the, uh, the diagnostic criteria that is, uh, that is there for DSM in, in, terms of, um, in terms of how you would diagnose for a major depressive episode. And you need a major depressive, you need one major depressive episode to have a major depressive disorder. So you need five or more of these symptoms here, and you need them for about a two-week period. Now, when we're working with adults, I, I think it's, we, can, we look at these different symptoms and we say, well, we've seen this before with adults. You know? they'll, they'll talk about depressed mood. They'll talk about feeling sad all the time. It's hard, it's hard to, to get out of bed, fatigue, things like that. They talk about that things just don't taste the same. Things are not as pleasurable as they once were. We have the criteria for them. Now, on the other hand, with kids, on the other hand, if you look at those, a lot of times we don't see that all the times with our kids. They don't have a predominant mood state of depression for a two-week period all the time. Now, the one guidance we do have from DSM is this one little small note <laughs> that's, underneath, that's underneath depressed mood. And, and, and that's pretty much the only guidance we have. And it, it should be like, it's probably like in 10-point font. It's small. You can miss it. When in re reality, it should be bolded. Note, in children and adolescents can be irritable mood. Now, if we think about kids, do we have kids that have a lot of irritable mood states? And they have their, pretty much their predominant mood state is irritable. We see a lot of kids like that. And all of a sudden, this is making a lot more sense for our kids. We see those kids that have difficulties with sleep. They have issues of, of, of maybe loss of energy. And particularly, we see a lot of times the anhedonia, which anhedonia means uh, sort of the lack of pleasure or loss of pleasure in things. Um, they describe feeling bored all the time or something like that. Now, when we talk about kids, uh, particularly adolescents, who have depression, a lot of times we see a lot of common comorbidities, other types of diagnoses that go along with depression or a major depressive disorder. We'll see things like cognitive disorder, ADHD, um, ODD, oppositional divine disorder, and then a host of other disruptive behaviors. Okay? Now, I'm just going to kind of go through some of these, but you know, it's really interesting when you think of, for example, you have a kid that is depressed, but then they also have a conduct disorder. If you think of conduct disorder, you know, in many ways, it's thought of as a precursor to like antisocial personality disorder or a precursor to more psychopathy or to more psychopathic ways of seeing the world. That at some point, they're, they're going to have a, a lack of remorse, something like that. So what we're saying is, is that somebody who has a precursor for antisocial has, is guilt-ridden, <laughs> that feels depressed. And I can tell you that most people who are antisocial, that's one of the central features, is it's almost like they're devoid of those emotional states. 
So theoretically, there's something wrong there. We're simply just looking at the behaviors of the person to say, oh, they have a conduct disorder, when in reality it might be something else. In addition, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, we see a lot of kids that have depression, and then they also have problems with inattention. Now, I don't know how many people out here have been depressed. I don't mean always in a psychiatric way, but it's just a reactive depression. Is your attention all that great? Probably not. Um, you know, my job is to really kind of help understand what is the diagnostic picture. And I don't even have the tools to really understand what inattention is ADHD and what inattention is a serious mood disorder. That's really hard to kind of figure out. And then ODD, which I think is, is indicative of, of a lot of the disruptive types of behavior, fighting, um, uh, running away, problems with the legal system, substance abuse problems. Now, I think there's a general, it's generally implied in, in sort of the DSM, when we think about depression, this one-size-fit-all depression, that when we see these comorbidities with, in, in children with these problems, that, that the depression is really more secondary that the depression is more of a consequence of them having all these other problems. And I, I think there's a fundamental flaw there. Maybe there's something else. Maybe instead, depression is really causing a lot of these problems. And, and you know, in, the, in, a, in a more of the psychoanalytic tradition, we've had a, a number of people who have studied this and have thought about it in many different ways, basically. This is one, uh, one, one individual who talked about, called it mass depression. And his belief was that depression really was at the root of a lot of the difficulties with disruptive behavior. And then in general, that maybe that all of these um, activations in these behavioral um, disruptions was really more defensive. It was a way to get away from that, that feeling of despair, that feeling of smallness, that feeling of inadequacy. The problem here is that they end up causing a lot of problems in their life. And so what happens? They keep, it sort of, they get into situations that continue to reconfirm those negative beliefs about themselves. They get into a situation that, that people want to get rid of them. They get into situations where they can't live here no more. You have to go somewhere else. So it perpetuates this depressive orientation. In addition, the other idea here is that in many ways when we see people who have depression, they may have some thoughts and some fantasies that tend to be more self-destructive in nature. Whether that's suicidal, risk, you know, feeling like you want to hurt yourself, things like that. And, and in actually, this is a way of kind of getting rid of that in some fashion by being destructive externally. You know, we're going to spend a lot of time on this section talking about the different experiences of depression. Because I don't feel like depression is just a one-size-fit-all thing. I think it, it, it might be helpful for people who are trying to, um, to get a quick understanding of what's going on in that kid's life or how best to medically treat them or something like that. But from a psychotherapeutic standpoint, we need to be able to understand what is their experience of depression so that we can be in a best situation to help them. So we're going to talk about experiences, and then we'll also then talk a little bit about treatment as we move on. And then, um, and then we'll also provide uh, some different ways of looking at depression, and particularly different ways of uh, uh, different types of depressive states, and potentially they require different types of treatment, or different frames of treatment, I should say. You know, the first one that I'm going to talk about today is, um, is, is bereavement, or complicated mourning. And we're not talking about the typical grief reactions that people should have, should have, when a loved object is lost. You know, when a, when a caregiver dies, when, when uh, the parents divorce, um, when the child loses the girlfriend or loses somebody important in their life, there should be a grief reaction to that. What we're talking about here is when it gets to a point where it's, it's, it ends up messing up parts of their life. It's not just simply they're grieving at this point. They, they move into a depressive stance, and it really disrupts their functioning. And that's really what we're talking about here. Now, I think a lot of times when people think of mourning, we tend to think of, uh, of, of death. But it's really loss in general. 
Um, it could be, for example, um, uh, like I said, the, a divorce. It could be, uh, it could be a death. It, it could be incarceration. It could be uh, uh, abandonment by a caregiver. Those are aspects where a lot of times issues of complicated mourning arise. Um, I, I think in addition, if you wanted to be very liberal, you could kind of think of almost sort of a, a loss of innocence or a loss of childhood as, as a result of neglect or something like that. There's aspects of complicated mourning in that, perhaps, as well. Now, I think a lot of times the affective states, and, and as we talk about these different experiences, I'm going to talk about them along different dimensions. I'm going to talk about them along dimensions that I think is very important to think about when we're actually treating people. For example, what is the affective state? What is emotionally going on with this individual? What, is the, uh, what are the common uh, thoughts or fantasies? That the, and when I say fantasies, I mean those, maybe those belief structures that it's a little bit harder to get at sometimes, that the person might be having in that type of, of, of mood, uh, that type of depressive state. And then, of course, what do they look like physiologically? What does their behavior look like? And then, of course, finally, how does this impact the relationships in their life? How do they view relationships, and how does this impact them? And I think that's a really important piece. And we're going to actually end up spending a lot of time on that piece as the, as the, uh, as the presentation continues. So affectively, people with complicated mourning, you tend to see, um, you know, of course, you see a lot of issues of, of, of despair or sadness, particularly when it's, a, when it's acute, when it just happens. As it moves on, there might be anger, there might be rage, there might be uh, what I would call sort of, sort of defensive, sort of hypomanic kind of, you know, I, I think sometimes in terms of their thoughts or their fantasies they might have, particularly with very young children, there's always the concern of them internalizing the blame. That at some level, what they'll say is they, they attempt to make sense out of what happened by saying, it was my fault. Now, of course, that might be some kind of internal belief structure that it takes a while to get to. But that at some level, there might be a sense of that it's because of my badness inside that this all happened. Now, the, the, the ideas behind that is, in some way, uh, the child always looks within, but it's also a way to protect um, the caregiver. It's, it's a way to protect you know, the, the dependency that one has on a caregiver. If you begin to hate the caregiver, that's not a really good position to be in. So instead, you blame oneself. And I think a lot of times in complicated mourning, there's always something going on there. And I think it's, it's important to kind of keep our eyes peeled for things like that. And of course, it may be vague. It may not be a coherent thought that I believe X. It may be we might see that or, or believe that based on some of the other things that the person's saying. I think another thing that tends to happen sometimes, particularly when you have some type of abandonment that occurs, um, there is times when the, the child will begin to idealize the caregiver. You know, in terms of, in, in terms of somatically, I think we see a lot of typical uh, uh, of depress depressive kind of aspects where there's a lot of anhedonia, there's lack of pleasure, there's, uh, they tend to have sort of more fatigue, things like that. We tend to describe feeling bored. Um, and then, of course, sometimes we see the agitation. And, and the belief there is that maybe this is a defensive reaction to things. Now, in terms of the relationships, um, I, I think one of the things that I think as, as, as a therapist, as the clinician, perhaps, or the person working with the child, I should say, um, I, I think we should always be aware that the person may begin to form some dependency on us as a result. Uh, they may worry about sort of, um, at some level, another abandonment in their life. And one way that I can prevent that is by getting closer and closer and closer. The problem with that is, in the real world, what happens is, as that person continues to move closer and closer and closer, the other person backs away most times. And then it sort of reconfirms this abandonment cycle. And I think in therapy, it's very important to 
to stop that. The second experience that we're going to talk about is more indicative of, of what we see sort of in DSM. What we're here we're talking about is sort of the major depressive disorder, major depressive episode. We're talking about people that feel unloved. They feel at, at some level uh, very sad. They talk about feeling depressed. Um, they feel unsupported, they feel hopeless, they feel helpless. In children, adolescents, a lot of times, we tend to see this more irritability a lot of times. And, uh, and, and, and sort of typically thought of as more of a defensive. In terms of their thoughts or fantasies, I would say most, most times uh, they really parallel, I think, the affective states. Meaning, if the person feels depressed, their thoughts will be depressive thoughts. Okay? Uh, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm a terrible person. Everybody hates me. Um, life is meaningless. The school sucks. Bullies are always hitting me. Things like that. One of the things that I, I think, in addition, you'll find, I think, it, when you meet with people, particularly if you're able to develop a, a real, thera a strong therapeutic relationship with these individuals, that they tend to be a lot. They, there's a lot of preoccupation with harm. Sometimes they talk about feeling like, um, oh, um, I'm worried about people dying or something like. They may have more suicidal or vague suicidal or passive suicidal kind of ideation. What would it be like if I wasn't here kind of statement? Not saying they're primarily suicidal, but that in some fashion there's lots of harm involved. And when you get really into their fantasy, sometimes you find out there's some real disturbing things in there. There's some real violence involved. In terms of the somatics complaints, we tend to see is, I think a lot of times with children at least, we tend to see a lot of lethargy. We tend to see also uh, just a general sense, I don't feel good kind of statements, things like that. Um, they look sick <laughs> physically. There's just a general malaise to them. Um, and I think relationally, uh, they, they just tend to feel failed by others a lot of times. And I think also, you know, it, it's difficult to be with depressed people because it's hard for them to give back and, and they really tend to strain relationships. You know, it, you, you see a parent who's been working with a depressed kid for a long period of time. You know, they, they talk about, you know, they, there's sort of a, an angry aspect to their feelings toward the child sometimes. And it's just because I think they're not able to give. And it's also, I think, indicative of how, how depleted they may feel or how inferior they may feel in not being able to help. I want to include uh, bipolar presentations in here as well. Just given that I think a lot of times in a, in, in a true bipolar presentation, there is a lot of depression involved, okay? The idea behind bipolar illnesses is that, you know, we're talking about someone who experiences emotion on both poles, both on both sides of the dimension, and the dimension being sort of more elated to more depressed, and that the person kind of fluctuates between each pole. Okay. Now, I, I think what confuses it is if we think about depression as also having irritability involved. Okay. That we can have kids that are simply depressed, not a bipolar illness. They're just depressed, but there's lots and lots of irritability. I think in many ways it's, very sometimes, it's sometimes very hard to kind of distinguish, are we talking about somebody who's a unipolar depression, meaning they're always on the depressed end of the spectrum, or are we talking somebody who's actually on both ends? And that's not really a hard, uh, I think, um, um, a hard diagnosis sometimes to, to cipher. And what makes it even worse is some of the medications that work for bipolar illnesses also work for those kids who have, have more irritable types of depression. What we're talking about here is people that, that don't just kind of hang out on this side of the depressive kind of continuum. We're talking about people that actually kind of are over here, and then sometimes they're over here. Sometimes they hate themselves, but you know what, sometimes, they're the best person, everybody likes them, and they have friends everywhere. So they move back and forth between self-critical attitudes to grandiose attitudes. They move back and forth between uh, being very sort of, they're, they're psycho, uh, they have a lot of uh, uh, physiological issues, meaning, for example, sometimes they'll sleep all the time, and then sometimes they don't need any sleep whatsoever. Sometimes they are depressed, lethargic, and sometimes they're just really activated. In kids, I think a lot of times we tend to see and I think the main thing here, and it's probably it's a, it's, a, it's a hard thing to go by, but I think it's one of the things that's very common with kids that have a bipolar presentations, is it seems like they're driven by impulse. 
It's like whatever they feel just comes right out at some level. Okay? And that could be happiness, it could be sad, it could be everything. So you put a kid in a bad situation, they, they act out in aggressive ways or something like that. But you put them into like a birthday party and they're bouncing off the walls you know, with happiness, things like that. They can't control either emotion very well or either side of the emotional spectrum. In addition to the thoughts and, and fantasy sections, you see a lot that parallel the mood states. And what I mean by that is, their thoughts tend to be more chaotic. Their thoughts tend to kind of just move around all the time in terms of their affective state. So we're talking about a person who has a lot of emotional dysregulation. We're talking about a person who has a lot of affective chaos in their life. Well, the thoughts would probably mirror that. And what you tend to find sometimes with these kids that have bipolar presentations is their thinking is very disorganized. Very disorganized. It's hard for them to make sense out of really what's occurring. And it, it, it comes out a lot of times in their relationships where, for example, they tend to misconstrue the relationships quite a bit. So is this, this, this relationship is going to be so helpful for me? Or it moves all the way to the end where kind of they get a little paranoid at times, you know, that this is, they're out to hurt me, they're out to get me kind of way. So I think in some ways it can go uh, that they, they really, uh, their thought disorganization tends to really impact their ability to interpret what's going on in the relational field. Whenever we talk about depression, you know, we have to spend time talking about suicide and suicidality. Um, when we're talking about suicidality here, I'm not talking about the typical um, passive or vague suicide ideations that a person who's depressed or even in mourning may have. You know, for example, what would it be like if I died? Who would show up at my funeral? Um, you know, the world would be better off without me kind of statements. Um, these are the people that we really are worried about. But in terms of suicidality, I think the, what I'm talking about here is something very different. When the main affects tend to be more anger and rage, that these people do not feel supported. They typically are in relationships that are very unsatisfying, and a lot of times those people in those, care, those caregiving situations are, are angry or hostile. They tend to do a lot of rumination or brooding on very negative themes. And their responses are less like depressed and more sort of tension states. Lots of rage responses, meaning there's muscles tight. They are very, very uncomfortable people. Both, I think, you know, internally, but also to even be in the rooms.